Hi, Welcome. everyone. Yep. Thank you. My name's Robin. I'm a PhD student here at Muni Sanchenko, so I did not have a long commute today. And just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge traditional owners of the land that we're all gathered on and where I work, the Gabi Gabi people. Uh, so just a quick show of hands. Who here knows what an insectivorous bat is or microbat? Wonderful. So clearly a very biased sample, because when I'm talking to members of the public, I'm about 50-50 that they even know they exist. It's really interesting doing uh, research on animals where the general public doesn't know that they exist or doesn't really know what they are. So just so we're all on the same page. Um, insectivorous bat just means insect eating. They're also known as microbats. Colloquially, it's not the most precise term. So in the science um, field, I get yelled at if I say microbat. Uh, but basically, tiny flying bats, they're not going to be eating fruit like our flying foxes. And because they're much smaller, they're much quieter, they do tend to fly under the radar, so to speak. Not many people know they're around. But even in southeast Queensland alone, we have 26 native species of insect eating bats. So they're actually really common. And they are really common in our urban spaces, and especially the suburbs. So it's really not uncommon for people to have these animals living in their house sometimes right next to them. I've got um, a bat landlord with bats that live inside his house in the rafters. He just vacuums underneath them and goes about his daily business. Um, you might not be able to see very well, which is a bit of the point here, but these are some uh, little broad-nosed bats, so Scotoricans gray eye. They live in a shed up in Kuroi, so just up the road from here. And there's only about 10 of them. They live there full time. That's their long-term home. It'd be really easy to miss. So these guys weigh in at about six grams each pretty tiny little animals, um, and they don't make much of a fuss, not very messy, not very smelly, really easy to miss. So they are definitely a cryptic animal. And my project is looking at how living right next to people, sometimes in their house or right next to their house, is impacting these guys, which means I need to find a lot of people with bats in their buildings, and pool umbrellas, and sheds, and they are really hard to find. So I had a lot of challenges along the way. I'm about a year into this project, so I thought I'd share some learnings and insights that I've had. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that citizen science plays a really huge work uh, role in bat research in general. I think it's one, a really important aspect of bat work because it's an often maligned group. Obviously, bats don't have the best street cred. Uh, they get a lot of bad reputations. But integrating citizen science into our research is a really great way to increase bat conservation awareness. So throughout this project, I'm doing lots of bat walks where we go out with echolocation detectors to detect certain species, establish presence and absence. Um, I've been using a lot of iNaturalist records, so if you've ever posted anything about a bat in an area on iNat, I've seen it, thank you very much. And I've been working with a lot of my fellow bat rescuers and rehabilitators, so that's a space I've been in for a long time, and bat rescuers and wildlife rescuers in general are really incredible sources of data, and they often don't end up ever interacting with academics or other environmental agencies. Um, every single animal that comes into our wildlife hospitals and wildlife rescuers gets recorded down to the species level, but that data doesn't necessarily go into any other platforms besides their own personal um, reporting systems through their permits. So luckily, um, I'm in that space, so I've been able to work with a lot of those rescuers, getting uh, fecal samples, reference calls, growth chart data for species that have never been publicly published yet. So really exciting space and really critical component of how I do science, especially in the bat space. Um, overall, what I'm trying to find out is how living near humans impacts our insectivorous bat species. So looking at stress hormone levels, body weight, they're having lots of babies. In general, um, living in a roost is make or break. So if you live in a really good home, you're going to have healthy body weight. You're going to ideally, hopefully, not have high stress levels. You're going to have lots of babies. If you live in a really bad roost, if there's something that's threatening you or really not ideal conditions, that can be really detrimental to a species. It's a concept of an ecological trap. Similar with a bee hotel, if you build a really um, bad space for them and they're living in it, um, that can really have long-term impacts for that local species because if they're not having lots of babies or their babies have high mortality rates, uh, obviously that has problems down the line. So really important to find out and we just don't know very much about bats living in man-made structures in Australia in general. So what I've been doing is working with what I like to call bat landlords. And basically, these are people who have bats living in and around their buildings and homes. And it's been a really rewarding component of this project. They're not just my field sites. They're also actively participating in the science. So a lot of my bat landlords have been living with bats for a long time. I've got one lady who's had bats for 30 years. 
She knows these bats. She knows when they showed up. She has photos of various bats she's found over the years. She can give me information about mortality events. I've got bat landlords who can give me exact numbers and counts of their bats that they've been watching over time. They send me photos, videos, data, um, and they're really excited about it. So it is obviously challenging trying to work with lots of members of the public, gather lots of data. I think that's the reason why historically hasn't been done as much. It's a little bit easier to just go get a permit for your local national park and do bat surveys there. But we are integrally tied now with our ecosystems, especially if you live in peri-urban spaces. Um, your bats are there. They are actively influenced by your behavior, how much artificial light you have, your cats, um, your living habits. And we don't understand the implications of that, um, but bat landlords are out there. Same with awesome landlords, snake landlords. There's a lot of people sharing their spaces now with our Australian wildlife, uh, and they have a lot to say and a lot to offer as citizen scientists. So it's really been rewarding to work with these people. Um, and they've been really excited to hopefully get some answers soon about their little bats, basically. I've tried a lot of different techniques over the last year to find my bat landlords, um, really just focusing in the Brisbane metro area because I am one person with very limited resources. Uh, but I have a couple insights. I was really surprised by some of my successes and failures. I've been working in wildlife outreach and conservation and tourism for a long time. And I was really thinking that my um, outreach events, uh, public awareness campaigns were gonna be really successful. But what I found was that Facebook rules all. <laughs> Facebook's the answer. Um, out of about six or seven public outreach events, including bat walks, citizen science activities, bio blitzes, awareness days, I got one roost <laughs> um, out of like 48 in the area. So uh, a lot of time and effort in those outreach events didn't necessarily translate to a lot of uh, usable data for my PhD. Doesn't mean they're not worth doing. They're obviously really rewarding and important for awareness. But if I could go back a year ago, if anyone's trying to do a project similarly, I would have posted to Facebook immediately. Um, and this is specifically community groups. So local community Facebook pages, local suburbs, down to the zip code, small groups um, tend to have very active community members. Um, and I pretty much had a one-to-one -one ratio. I posted about 25 local groups saying, hi, this is a weird question, but does anyone have bats living in their house? And I got about 21 bat roosts out of 25 groups. So really high amounts of engagement, incredibly positive feedback from the public as well. I didn't get a single negative comment, which I was shocked. So that was really great. Um, and word of mouth and Land for Wildlife was also incredibly helpful for me. So Land for Wildlife and local councils reaching out to their members, um, land care groups as well, spreading the word. Word of mouth is really, really helpful. Um, and I will point out as well that uh, the bat rescue groups, I was hoping that would lead to more um, records for me, but we ran into this challenge where even though I've got the support of my groups, I've got um, a lot of really dedicated bat rescuers who are really passionate about this research, we run into this issue of uh, data collection as well as data ethics. So unfortunately, when we're going out and doing these rescues, everything's usually a bit rushed. People sometimes drop off an animal at a wildlife hospital without leaving their name or number, so we lose a lot of data that way. And we also haven't really been future-proofing our data. So unfortunately, um, a lot of these records, we didn't write down their name or we didn't ask at the time, would you be interested in participating in any research in the future? And so we can't necessarily go back and get those records from the past. Uh, luckily, we've been trying to make some changes, at least with some of my local groups. Now I've got people asking when they go out to a rescue, hey, I actually have a researcher really interested in this. Um, here's their email if you're interested. She'd love if you get in touch and I've gotten a couple records that way. But you can imagine we've basically lost decades of potentially really interested people who really want to engage with the research because we haven't been kind of future proofing. So if I have any advice from this experience, there are certainly going to be private property owners who have really high value animals um, at sites. So yellow belly glider feed trees or cow for owl nest or bat roost that are going to be there long term could be really important for future research. Um, and anything we can do to write that down and then future proof that by saying, hey, this might be really valuable. Would you ever be interested in a research or getting in touch? Is that something you'd be invested in? I've actually found bat landlords um, who I found on Facebook, who've reached out to me, who had a bat rescuer come years ago, but that didn't get written down, written down properly. That means that there's gonna be a lot of people that I'm missing who'd be really passionate about it, who I just haven't been able to connect with yet because we've lost that data. So just some preliminary results quick. Um, I actually have bats that live in a beat hotel here on the Sunshine Coast. It's super cute. Um, they're Easter broadnose bats, um, so tiny little guys. There's about 12 of them. 
that live in the Little Butterfly slot have a bee hotel. They've been there for years. Um, so they definitely can get pretty creative with their man-made roost. They're looking for something that mimics what they have in the wild. So these are species that would normally be living in tree hollows under hollow bark. So they're going to be living in something that kind of replicates it. We also have our weirdos, the Dictopolis, or the long-eared bats. So you can see they like to live in bells. Um, so they'll be in cowbells, lampshades, um, some really weird places. If I get a random email about a bat in a bell, it's always a long-eared. Um, and then I'll also highlight um, our shower bats. So uh, Redenophilus, which is our horseshoe bats, they like to live in caves in the wild. And so what they've worked out is that a shower cubicle or kind of a laundry room type space with high humidity and solid walls, pretty much the same thing. Uh, again, we don't understand how that's impacting them. Is it just as good as a cave? Or is roosting in a shower cubicle maybe having some long-term impact? We don't know that yet. But I, I think it's really interesting to see how these guys have adapted to our human spaces. Um, we've basically taken all the, the natural sites that they would have been roosting in, and they've had to adapt in turn. I also wanted to point out that it's pretty clear uh, the people that are mostly interfacing with bats tend to live in the burbs, peri-urban spaces, semi-rural. You don't get a lot of bat roost in the city because there's not very much food. Now, bats are really impacted by artificial light at night, like a lot of our nocturnal animals, so you're just not going to find them living in really brightly lit areas at high amounts, um, but these peri-urban spaces are where I tend to get all of my sites, which is really going to be the areas where we may see the most wildlife human conflict in the future as well. So important implications for human health as well as bat health. That's the areas that might need the most attention in terms of better habitat, um, hopefully conservation mitigation techniques to make sure that their bats are healthy and the humans are healthy, especially when you live underneath them like some of my bat landlords. Um, I know I talk too much, so just quick video before we have to wrap it up. Uh, so this is a video that one of my bat landlords sent me. So his three tail bats live in the apex of his house roost. He's had them for years. Um, he sent me this video at 4 a.m., which is highly motivated citizen scientist here. Um, so this is them coming in for a landing. So he's very familiar with his bats. He's giving me so much information, so much data. And you can really see that even though they're small and cryptic, if you know about them, if you know where they are, it's actually quite easy to get things like emergence counts. I would love for Australia to get more on board with this idea of bat citizen science. Other continents have been doing this for a while, so England especially has um, a lot of really amazing programs where teams of the community come out to monitor bat roost, get things like this, emergence counts, uh, numbers monitoring, and emergence timings, which can tell us a bit about how they're adapting to their environment. It would be great to have more content like this. Um, there's not been a lot of research in this space, so I would love to get more information about this moving forward. We also have bats and pool umbrellas, which is always super cute. Uh, this is in the Glasshouse Mountains. You can see the Glasshouse Mountains in the background. And it doesn't seem like the best place to live. Obviously pretty exposed to the elements, like rain, wind. Um, umbrellas degrade and fall down, but uh, bats are just nuts about patio umbrellas. Here in southeast Queensland, it's mostly our broad-nosed bats, the Scotorican species. Um, seems that down in Victoria and other areas, um, they are not nearly as common in the umbrellas. It tends to be gold swaddled bats. So we're seeing some regional differences as well. That would be really awesome to get more information about long term if we could expand this kind of project further. And finally, bats in a bath mat. Super cute. These are um, large footed myotis. They're fishing bats. They're highly specialized, only live by water. That means if their creek or their dam dries out, they need to either move or die. Um, water is really critical to their ecology. And these guys have been living in this mat for 15 years. And some maternity roosts. There's some babies in there. So uh, really, really excited to study them. I can't wait. Starting field work in a week or two. So if you have bats or you know where bat roosts are, let me know. I would love to hear from you. Um, I, right now I'm really focused on Brisbane metro area, but I am pretty obsessed with these guys. So if you have bats somewhere else, I'd love to hear about it, um, especially if you have photos or data points. And if you've ever have recorded a bat presence, um, echolocation, a photo, a bat roost, please put that on my naturalist. I'd love to get some more sightings in there. Okay, thanks guys. Let me know if you have any questions. Wow. Gee, thank you for a fantastic chat about thanks. bats. Um, I must say I like the idea about um, nuts about bats. <laughs> That's a good T-shirt. <laughs> but the uh, the one thing that did stick to me was um, 
science in the bat space and bat landlords that's a great way of, of getting people involved just that that term alone really really resonated but any any questions we can kind of get back in if not um so in la county we do have bats uh the wex monkey tail bat which seem to have a slightly higher tolerance for urban environments and the noise and light that comes with it is there a species that is similar here that you think could potentially have that tolerance too? Yeah, so a super interesting field of study. Australia gets left behind in a lot of these um, global studies. There's been a couple of papers that have come out hypothesizing that free tail bats um, are especially adapted to urban spaces, which might be true in other continents, but at least in the Sunshine Coast, uh, they're about my third most common in many ways structures. So it's our going to reap into our broad nose bats. Um, that's not ever been done comparatively, so we're still in early stages, and it's just because no one really locally in Australia has gone out and, and surveyed for all these sites. So there's so much that we need to know. Um, almost all of our bat species are endemic, so as far as I can tell, the free tails are not nearly as adapted as our broad nose bats, but it might be a hyper-regional bias that I'm seeing at the moment. I was wondering, did you find any relationship between stress and being close to bees? So I haven't started that part yet. That starts next week. Um, it's taken me about nine months to find my sites. So I'm stay tuned. I'm really keen to, to work that out. That will be really exciting. Hi, Robin. Um, should we or, or, or uh, can we build roosts in our suburban backyards ourselves, like we do for birds and other things? Yeah, great question. Controversial in the bat community. Uh, Bat houses, so man-made, um, deliberately built sites, don't seem to benefit all species equally. It seems to be a bias towards a couple, the golds, wattle bats and golds longing bats really like a bat house. Um, and we don't see a, a lot of species uptaking them. That doesn't mean they're not worth installing. Uh, but in, from what I'm seeing, good habitat, tree hollows, um, that's going to be your best bet. Just increase the amount of insects around um, probably is going to be more worth it if you have limited resources and time at least locally here. Uh, but with that said, I'm not looking into the bat houses specifically. So there's probably some people who've done a lot more research on that who could better answer. Um, great talk, thank you. Um, we had a bat heat stroke type event in our town and the town just panicked about this virus and that they were going to be dangerous in the community. How, how do we get good information out to the community about safe interaction with bats and which, you know, what what can be done about that? Yeah, so those are flying foxes or fruit bats that are really vulnerable to heat stress. Uh, insect diverse bats are a lot less vulnerable uh, and responsible, at least locally in Australia, for a lot less um, of disease and viral spillover incidents. But with that said, Australasian Bat Society has a lot of really great pamphlets and handbooks um, just about really good bat um, communication techniques. So I'd really advise Australasian Bat Society um, look up those flyers, they're really great. And the biggest message is no touch, no risk. So if you find an injured bat or um, you, there's a heat stress event, just Google your lo location and bat rescue, get a vaccinated um, rescuer out to come respond. Um, there's no reason that we have to have um, escalating levels of wildlife human conflict if we can do it smart and responsibly. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm also definitely happy to chat afterwards. 